too, to invite everyone that might be out in the foyer, uh, out in the registration area. If you can make your way into the sanctuary, uh, we want to begin probably at 12 noon. So if you're outside in the foyer, please, if you don't mind, make your way back into the auditorium. Father, to be doers of your word 
and not just give it to them. We pray, Father, that you will crown the heads of Brother Poole, Brother Thomas Davis, Brother Ricky Cook, Ricky Cook, Brother Chris Brown. Crown their heads, Father, today with the knowledge and wisdom and all spiritual understanding so they may be able to boldly bring the word to each of us today. We ask you, Father, now to forgive us of any sins that we may have committed, knowingly or unknowingly, Father. And Father, we pray that you would give us the opportunity and time to repent of those sins, those sins as well. We pray all the brothers and sisters of the sick and children that would love to be with us today, but Father, we cannot. We pray, Father, that you would bless them and be with them as we continue our program. Be with everyone today and continue blessings in every one of us today. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will have a song I'm going to share.
later to Dave to be the MC of this program. But you guys have to keep me in prayer. I'm praying that we do a good job. Trying to keep these brothers from going over to town. So pray for me on that regard. I, I want to comment about today. I just want to present to the brothers the, the, uh, the sequence of events that we as they prepare to present themselves. So uh, we're going to use the color code a little bit today. When the brother sees the yellow, uh, sign, the card, that means you have five minutes. Again, yellow, five minutes. So now when the brothers, I'll keep the time keeping today as well. So when the brothers see the red, okay, that means the brothers have two minutes. That means you have two minutes. So I'll just flash. I can bring it up or I can show it to either one. We'll go with this, bring it up to the stage. So now I'll be sitting right here. So when I stand, I won't have a color code and card or anything. I'll be standing. So that means time is up. So pray for me. That's what I ask for your prayer because I can get to keep big brothers in check. So brothers, I'll be all the clear. We're good on the, on the scheme. Okay. So uh, I just want to say this as we begin to bring the brothers up. Uh, we thank God for making it possible for us to be here today. He has guided us and he has protected us. He will continue to guide and protect us with the opportunity to worship him. Now, our subject today is parables and life experiences. Opportunity, purpose, and principle. Again, parables and life experiences. Opportunity, purpose, and principles. And the brothers will be speaking today on this subject. We all have the scripture. Uh, be, I'll be reading, not the scripture for them, but I'll present to you the scripture that they'll be reading at this time. So as, as we move into uh, our presentation today, our first speaker today is Brother Wade Poole. Now, I'm going to say this. Now, Brother Poole is from Arkansas. Um, Brother McCool is from Arkansas. And guess what? You are yours truly. Brother Andrew Johnson is from Arkansas. So, uh, 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 how good is that? Well, Brother from Arkansas and two other guys together. Brother Poole has been recently installed as the minister, as most of you know, as East Capitol Street Church of Christ in Washington, D.C. Brother Poole is a native of Fort Smith, Arkansas. Uh, his wife, uh, says that, uh, Theola, she's not here, but uh, she, they have been known for teaching Christian parenting and marriage, marriage and family classes on Maryland as well as the state of, of Arkansas. Now, Brother Poole mentioned about his pretension. I looked at Brother uh, Poole's pretension and it was like this long. So last night I was trying to figure out how to marry him. He is a veteran. Okay. Uh, he served probably in the United States Air Force, Arkansas National Guard, as well as the Arkansas Reserve. He spent 21 years in the military. He spent two tours in the government. At the Gulf War, Death of Seal, Death of Storm. Uh, he was also featured in the September 3rd VA uh, Insider News for Veterans Experiences, Veterans Helping Veterans. We want to thank him for helping us veterans. And he is married to Sister Theoma Poole, who is not with us today. They have two adult children. The subject that Brother Poole will be teaching from today is. It's not where you begin, but where you end. It's not where you begin, but where you end. It'll be coming from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Brother Dr. Wade Poole. 
members of the East Campus History Church of Christ. Thank you. Thank you so much.
there is favor in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Listen, Matthew likens the kingdom of heaven to a landowner who went out early that morning to hire workers like you and I in the vineyard. See, 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 what we see here is that in the story, the laborers presume God as being unfair, partial to some workers over others. See, in believing that there is partiality with God, they were wrong because showing partiality is sin. James 2 9. See, since God cannot sin, what we see here is that we are unable to be, He is rather unable to be impartial. We see the Hebrew writer in 16 says, God is not unrighteous to forgive your works of labor, of love. He knows your work in the vineyard. Listen, God is not only there, but he notices the generosity of God, his equity in the kingdom. Equity is the state of being equal. It establishes the status, your rights and opportunities in the kingdom of God. See, from the pulpit to the pew, what we see here, that God is still there. God, because of his generosity, we have the opportunity to be treated one like the other with God. God pays everyone a fair wage for their work. In other words, every child of God is treated the same. Every child of God must work out their own soul salvation. Philippians 2.12 Because of God's generosity, everyone in the kingdom of God has the opportunity to inherit eternal life. Luke 18, 18. Get this in your spirit. Everyone receives the same award. The psalmist says, God is fair and just. He corrects those misdirected. He sends them to the right direction. If you're on your journey, you're having problems, seek the wisdom from above. Seek God because God knows that he's fair. Weeks ago, many of you have seen the Supreme Court decision over in Judiciary Square in Washington, D.C. See, they made a decision to strike down affirmative action. They removed racial preference from the college admissions and process. See, the new ruling will doubt hurt us. What we've got to understand, it considers racial diversity in our hiring. That's going to impact us. See, in other words, the highest court in the land is saying because of this ruling, there is equity in every college and university. What God says, there is no equality. God says there is no equality. Thank God that he can look to, to his rule in the kingdom that man has no rule of the kingdom. God places equality in every body of Christ, the kingdom of God. He places equality in such a way that every child of God in the church has the same promises and the same opportunities in the church of Christ. But not only equality, God gives equity, equity to every child who needs in the kingdom. See, what this is, equity is about quality of being fair, impartial. God's equity recognizes that each person has their own different measure of their faith. Romans 12, 3. So God distributes, he apportions the exact measure of the faith that he needs from you to work in the vineyard. God knows exactly what you need to finish your work in the vineyard. See, early that morning, they, they, they found some workers to work. They were under a contract and agreement to do what they were supposed to do, and that's what they were supposed to earn. Those laborers knew from the start that they were received for their word, the word of their word. But look, he finds some workers that inquire, and he inquired rather, as to why they were not working. They said no one was there to hire them. Look at this. These workers were counting on the grace of the landowner. See, God generously, his generosity is fair. Equality rewards the child of God in the church. That's fair. God's expectation of you and your work to do your very best in the vineyard, that's fair. Watch God. God also rewards faithfulness and gives each of us our own measure in everything that we need to be successful in the 
church. That's equity. Watch this. James says, your faith without works is dead. James 2, 6, 26. God rewards your faith and your work. Next, let's look at your finish. God is concerned that we finish our race. In a spiritual race, you are going to be rather encounter all of these difficult things on your journey. You need to keep running. Don't give up. If you fall, you get right up. Repentance and prayer restores you back. Paul reminds Timothy, if we endure, we will also reign with him. 2 Timothy 2.12. What about the Hebrew writer? For you need endurance so that after you have God done by the God's will, you will receive what was promised. Hebrews 10.36. Then the Hebrew writer says, let us run with patience the race God has set before us. Hebrews 12, 2, and rather 12, 1 and 2. See, like the landowner, he's persistent in getting workers to come in the church. You have to go outside, get those who to come in. God wants us to reach as many people as possible. Notice the landowner did not tell the people he hired to just stand around. See, he didn't tell them when you come into the church, you don't just sit on the pew, but to get in the vineyard and do the work of the Lord. God wants us to work until we finish the job. God rewards each of us when we finish, but God is not like me. See, there is a, what is called a photo finish. See, in the Olympics, if everyone is tired, everyone is close, the man cannot see it with his eye. So he has to go to the photo finish. In the photo finish, if one part of the body gets a hold of the line, that piece the other, whether it's their head, their arm, their leg, that person is declared the winner. So man gives out a gold medal. He gives out a silver medal. He gives out a bronze medal for those who win first, second, and third, not of their journey. And once they get to the backstretch, they get to the end. If they come close, the, the, the announcer said, that's a blanket finish. Well, what are we saying about a blanket finish? A blanket finish is, it's like for the horse racing that when they finish and their noses are so close that they are so rude, you can't see. The, the announcer said, if they're so close, you have to place a blanket over them. So what that blanket is Says. God says that we all finish the same. So the last will be first and the first will be last. What is he saying here? Watch God's favor here. In verse 16, we find God's way of looking at things, not like man. God does not look at the photo finish. God looks at the blanket finish. God says if we're in the dead heat, it doesn't matter. If you're seven years of age or seven years of age. God said you still can receive eternal life. Watch God even down the backstretch. The generosity of God, the righteousness of God. God can heal us all eternal life. Don't think that you deserve a greater reward in heaven for all of the work that you do. God is not only the greatest than man. He is in the, in the face of man, rather. He is the great I am. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is new. God is omniscient. God is righteous. God transcends. He's the one true God. He is loving. He's kind. He's spiritual. He's incomprehensible. He's impeccable. He's impeachable. God is holy. God is good. God is independent. God is greater than man. Let me close here. Close word. Brother Johnson, stand down. Watch this. In the story, Brother Brett, there's a story about three boys who received some special passes from a sports owner team to invite them to an event. When they got to the event, the people placed the three boys all the way at the top of the arena. While they were up there in the arena and the game started, the boys could not see the game. What the owner did, he says, when he inquired of the boys, where are they located? They said that the boys was all the way at the top of the arena. Watch this. The owner 
He's the minister, Brother Castile, and all of us know and love. So, Brother Castile, thank you for sending Brother um, Thomas Davis out of the way. Now, Brother Davis' um, sermon today will be coming from his poor circulation will serve consequences. Again, poor circulation will Oh, I'm sorry. Poor calculation will serve consequences. Poor calculations will serve consequences. He'll be speaking to us from Luke chapter 12, verses 6 through 21. So after the song from Brother Shannon, and this voice that you'll hear will be Brother David. So it's my pleasure we're going to do to you after we have a song from Brother Shannon, Brother Thomas Davis, the minister at Southside Church of Christ in Winchester, Virginia. Yeah. 
opportunity to share God's word with you. And as was announced, my topic comes from Luke chapter 12. We will be reading that. It's the parable of the rich fool. And uh, it will start in verse 13 in a minute. And the title was Poor Calculations with Severe Consequences. Very interesting. So, by way of introduction, I want to begin by sharing this with you. It was the year 1928, and a group of the most successful financiers met at the Edgewood Beach Hotel in Chicago. The following were present. The president of the largest steel company, the greatest wheat speculator, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, a member of the President of the United States Cabinet, the greatest stock investor at that time on Wall Street, and the President of the Bank of International Settlements, and the head of the world's greatest Swedish industrial monopoly. Collectively, these business tycoons and financiers uh, had more wealth than the U.S. Treasury at that time. And the newspapers and magazines of that day, church, were saying, we should follow after these people. Young people, these are your examples and models. Strive to be like them. Well, within the next 25 years, this is what happened to those wealthy people. The president of the largest independent steel company, Charles Schwab, died broke. The president, the, the great, uh, the greatest wheat, wheat speculator, Arthur Cut, he lost his fortune and died suddenly of a heart attack. The president of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Whitney, was in prison. The member of the president's cabinet, Albert Fall, was pardoned from prison so that he could go home and die. The Wall Street investor, Jesse Livermore, committed suicide. The president of the Bank of the International Settlements, Leon Frazier, committed suicide. The Swiss industrialist, Ivor Kruger, Kruger rather, also committed suicide. Suicide. These men had spent their entire lives calculating and scheming to amass great fortunes, but in the end they found no joy, no happiness, only sorrow and despair. There were only terrible and severe consequences for a life filled from calculating how to amass well. And so that brings me to my parable, Luke chapter 12. Please turn there in your Bibles, in your devices, and read along with me. But first let me give you some context. Jesus is speaking before a crowd of thousands of people, the first verse of this chapter says, and he is rudely interrupted by a young man who complains to Jesus that his older brother is not dividing the family inheritance uh, equitably and is not treating his younger brother fairly in the, in the wealth to be distributed. So read with me, beginning at Luke uh, chapter 12, verse 13. And someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And he said to them, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? And Jesus said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, "What? This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will 
store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? And this is the point. Jesus ends and says, So is the man, so is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The brother realized that Jesus was a man of great significance in Israel. He had traveled around for many years and he was saying wonderful things and great crowds followed him. And he realized that he must have great influence. So he interrupts him in his talk about spiritual things and says, I need your help. My brother isn't treating me properly regarding our wealth. And Jesus doesn't allow, uh, Jesus uh, says, what? I'm not here to do that. You have your own judges and arbitrators in Israel that will handle these civil matters. Jesus did not come to become entangled in the civil matters of the, of the nation and of the people. The, he came to lead humanities to salvation. But Jesus uses this interruption, brothers and sisters, to teach a great lesson against an insidious disease of our human heart. That disease is greed. Greed in every form. This particular heart disease causes us to be so preoccupied with material possessions that we are blind to our great spiritual need and our need for God. We live in a country, do we not, where in a society where, where everything is measured by how much you have. Success is measured in terms of possessions and wealth. The more expensive the car, the bigger the house, the more exotic the vacation, the more jewelry worn, the fancier the clothes, the wealthier you are received to be. But the teachings of Jesus about wealth and materialism are counter-cultural. He says material possessions are not what we should focus on. Jesus' point of the story is that chasing wealth and accumulating materialistic things has terrible eternal consequences. However, chasing after God and amassing spiritual wealth has amazing eternal benefits. It should be noted that it's a serious matter to be called a fool by God. To be called a fool is to be lacking true wisdom. It is to be considered senseless, to be considered without proper reason, and without correct thinking or and lacking understanding. So why does God call this man a fool? Well, for the remaining time, whatever I have, and can I use Brother Fool's time if I need it? <laughs> Since he didn't take it all, <laughs> I'm going to share with you, I'm going to share with you four reasons, four reasons God called this man a fool. Reason number one, he's called a fool by God because he failed to give God glory his abundant harvest. There's an Old Testament verse back in Deuteronomy chapter 8 where um, God tells Moses to, to, to say when these people come in the land, give them this warning. Uh, and these are the words. Otherwise, uh, with regards to their wealth that they accumulate. Uh, and, and God says, otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who is giving you power to make wealth. Amen. No doubt, no doubt, the rich farmer worked hard. 
He plowed, he broke up the soil, he planted, he waited patiently, and now his hard efforts, efforts paid off. The harvest was, as we would say, a bumper crop. It was bigger than he even imagined. And yet, in the parable, there is not one mention or even the slightest little hint that the man recognized that all of these crops and the subsequent wealth that comes from it was from the hand of God. If you listen closely to when I read that, there are 11 times in the story that the man said, I or my. Not once did he give God credit for all that he received. I'm reminded of a similar story of a farmer and a preacher. The farmer had purchased a few acres of land. He bought it cheap because it had standing timber on it. It was covered with brush and weeds and giant boulders. It was, if you just looked at it, it looked like it was unfarmable. But yet, he worked hard. He spent many hours, long, hard hours, cutting down the trees, pulling out the boulders, cutting away the brush, plowing and breaking up the soil and, and planting the seed and fertilizing it and, and watering it. And at harvest time, lo and behold, it came forth with some of the most beautiful, some of the most bountiful crops that, it, that you, couldn't, you would have wouldn't imagined. The fields were lush and green to look at, and it was just a great field now. Preacher comes by, as we do in our visits, right? And he's complimenting the farmer on how great his field looks and the abundance of the harvest. And the preacher says that what a wonderful thing God has done with your land. Well, the farmer didn't take that too kindly. The farmer said with a kind of sarcastic tone to his voice, said, Preacher, I don't know about that. I put all the hard work into this land. You should have seen it when the Lord had it. And so this, this man in the story was like the foolish farmer. He forgot it was God who gave him the blessings of the harvest. He forgot it was God who brought the rain. He forgot it was God who warmed the, the fields with the sun. He forgot it was God who caused the earth to bring forth this bumper crop. This attitude of thinking and that we do, uh, that we have, and, and that is not recognizing God as the one who blesses our efforts, is the first step into becoming a fool when it comes to materialism and wealth. Yeah. And the second thing I want to say to you is, he became, he was called a fool because he trusted in his wealth. God called him a fool because he trusted in his wealth. Verse 19 says of the parable, I will say of my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Oh, the man was congratulating himself, was he not? Pat himself on the back, right? Because he was now wealthy with what he had. He could spend many years in retirement. Uh, he could live off of his accumulated wealth. He could travel. He could buy that shore home now, right? Why, why he could even spend winters in Florida. Right? And finally, he could enjoy life. He trusts in his wealth to keep him secure and content for the rest of his life. And he's not trusting in God for his security and his contentment. You know, God is not against our possessions. He only warns us not to trust in them. He only warns us not to trust in them, church, because wealth is deceptive. Wealth is fleeting. Wealth can be here one day and gone tomorrow. How many of you years ago, a couple years ago, opened up your retirement account and it was nothing in there? Right? One day, you, the day before you opened it up and there was something in there and then the big crash came in the next day. It's gone. But who do we trust? Do we trust our IRAs and our 401ks? Or do we trust in the God of heaven? 
who are rich do not be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies all things to enjoy. Jesus told uh, another wealthy man who had great possessions in Matthew 19, that rich young ruler, that he needed to give away his possessions. Now why? Was Jesus against possessions? No, he wasn't against possessions. But he knew the man had a heart disease. He knew he had a heart disease. And that heart disease is what that is that he, he, he trusted in the wealth from his real estate investments. And there was only one way to cure that. Give it away. Give it away. Go sell your properties. Give the proceeds to the poor. Why? So that you can free yourself up from the things that you are trusting in. And you will have treasure in heaven and follow me. Jesus went on to say to his disciples, you know, guys, it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven. You know why it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven? It's hard because the wealthier, wealthier you are, the more you trust in your wealth and the more difficult it is to let it go. Even, even for the blessing of eternal life. Remember this adage and remember it well. The more things you own, the more the things own you. And the more difficult it is to free yourself from them. Third reason this man is called a fool by God is because he failed to realize possessions are, are temporal, but the soul is eternal. Our worldly possessions are only temporary. They are not lasting or eternal. This rich, foolish farmer had so much that he had to build bigger barns to hold it all. And even if he knew he was going to leave it behind, he still thought to himself, I have still many years to enjoy this wealth. And the man says, Soul, you have laid up many uh, goods for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But in this case, church, there was none to be. Because God says, you fool, tonight I demand your soul. And during the night, he dies unexpectedly. How often do we hear of people dying unexpectedly? We wake up in the morning, we feel great, and by the evening, we're dead. We die from aneurysms, strokes, heart attacks, accidents, random shootings, and the list goes on and on. Unexpectedly dying. And it was the same for the rich farmer who died unexpectedly. He left all his wealth behind. Two men were talking about the death of a millionaire. And the one says to the other, how much did he leave? And the man said, he left it all. <laughs> Why Solomon? Why Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2 says that he realizes the futility of amassing wealth. He says, Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor. So that which is earthly must remain with the earth. And that which is spiritual must return to the spiritual. That night God demanded from the rich fool only one thing. It was the man's greatest treasure. His greatest possession. The one thing that he should have cherished and cared about all of his life. It was his soul. His eternal spirit. And so it is with all the temporal things we have amassed in our lifetime. Sooner or later they become the property of somebody else. And the only thing that we have to pass... James Montgomery Boyce, in a book entitled The Parables of 
Jesus says, everything you have must one day must be left behind. It is yours now to use or abuse, but one day it will be taken from you and you will stand naked before him who is your maker. How will you stand on that day? Will you stand as one who has put God first and has therefore come to see possessions as a gift from him to be used for his work? Or will you be one of the many who have sold out to possessions to the exclusion of all else and have died without the hope of salvation? Fourth reason this man's called a fool is because he was not rich towards God. The eternal spiritual truth of the parable is verse 21. So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So is the foolish man. The rich farmer had all the wealth that he thought he would need, and there was not one hint of using it to help those who had needs. He didn't use it for the poor. He didn't use it as a temple contribution. He used it only for himself. I will take my ease, and I will eat, and I will drink, and I will be merry. We all remember Jesus' profound words, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, for neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Paul took those words and expanded upon them and said in 1 Timothy 6, Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may hold so they may take hold of that which is life indeed. As I conclude, do not be like the foolish farmer. <laughs> he spent all his time and energy laying up temporal treasures for the world and had no regard for the welfare, for the welfare of, the, of his eternal, everlasting soul. Remember these four things, beloved of God. Remember, give God the glory possessions. Remember, trust God in all things and, and, and do not trust in your wealth. Remember, your soul is eternal and your possessions are temporal. Remember, be rich towards God, not rich towards yourself. Dear Christian friends, find ways to invest your wealth in heaven. Use your money and your possessions for the benefit of others and you will be storing up eternal treasures of great blessings and rewards. For on the day that God demands your soul, there will be a treasure of spiritual wealth waiting for you in the bank vaults with your name on it. God bless all of you. Thank you so much.
He's a graduate of Northeast Christian Junior College, a cook, you see his BS in Bible ministry, if I got all this correct, and a master, a master of divinity in ministry leadership from Anchorage University, I think he's in Alabama. At this time, we want to, Brother, Brother Cook is now serving as the minister of the Laurel Church of Christ and Laurel Miller. Miller. Brother Cook's message today would be, don't waste the sudden chance. Don't waste a sudden chance. The scripture will be coming from Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. At this time, I'd like to welcome Brother Cook for coming forward to give his message. We have a verse of the song from Brother Shannon, and the next voice you hear will be coming from Brother Ricky Cook. Thank you.
sister say on last evening uh, that being at this lectureship is like being at a family reunion. Yeah. I said, I'm going to make one amendment to that. It's not like a family reunion. It is a family reunion. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. We want to direct your attention to Luke chapter 13. Uh, the text assigned for uh, the subject that we have been appointed. Uh, Luke 13, beginning at verse number 6, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down by cumbering it the ground. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. From the appointed text, the assigned subject is don't waste a second chance. And as we consider the text that we have before us here in Luke chapter 13, the term second chance in our common vernacular refers to the opportunity to try again or to rectify a mistake or failure from the past. It can also refer to the forgiveness or leniency given to someone who has made a mistake or committed a wrongdoing. Now, thank God that with God, the second in this context is not little. If over my lifetime I were given one chance a day, and I'm not so naive as to think that I could have made it with just one chance a day, but if over my lifetime I had been given one chance a day, I would at this moment be in excess of 20,000 chances. Now, I don't know what chance I'm on, but I know I'm way past number two. Moreover, there is nothing from God to lead us to the conclusion that another chance is necessarily coming. The prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 received a second chance. However, the rich fool in Luke chapter 12 had reached the end of the road. The text before us here in Luke chapter 13 is the parable of the barren fig tree. In the immediate context of the parable, the certain man represents God, and the vineyard is the Jewish nation. Now, if you are familiar with your Old Testament, uh, then you are aware that God had given Israel many chances to honor the covenant that he had made with them. We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, beginning at verse 14, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them messengers, rising up at times and sinning, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. See, that's the second chapter. But they mocked the messengers of God, and despised his words, and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Amen. Any parent in here appreciates that I may give my child a second chance, but there comes a time when the talking is over, and it's time to get down to business. When Israel had proved themselves unworthy of God's favor, he allowed them to be overrun by the pagans. God had said to Israel, or, or, or maybe if you come from the old school, you know how your parents give you that look? 
you sit in worship service and they kind enough to let you sit away from them. Yeah. You know, I can't open that school where you sat next to your parents in worship service. But, but every now and then they let you sit with somebody else. But you know, mama would look over there and see you not following along with worship service and she'd give you that look. Now that, that look met you on your second chance. Now, now that look had varying degrees. Now, if she got up and headed to the back and did like this, then that meant you were out of chance. And, and I'm going to talk. But God had reached the point with Israel where he was through talking and they were out of chance. But this parable is profitable to us, not in being critical analysts of the shortcomings and errors of Israel, it profits us when we examine ourselves to see if we are in the same case as were they. Now allow me to be technical for a moment, even though I'm not a gardener, farmer, or keeper of a vineyard. The leaves on fig trees appear first, and the mature figs come later in the summer. But it is common for tiny figs to appear with the leaves. These are edible, edible, and gathered and sold in the marketplaces. You recall in Mark chapter 11, verse 13, that Jesus cursed the fig tree for having no fruit, even though it wasn't technically the season for, uh, for figs. Jesus, Jesus would have reasonably expected that there would have been some tiny figs, even though it was not the season, for the more robust form of a mature figs because there were some leaves on the tree. Now, the point in all of this is that God expects his creation to bear fruit. If we go all the way back to the beginning and the creation account, God created the world on the fruit-bearing principle. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. But watch this. The principle is not restricted to just plants. In, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 21, And God created great whales, and every living creature that moved it, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every wing fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And again, there's the principle of bearing fruit. But watch this, it doesn't stop with the plants and animals. It extends to humanity. Again in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. And in our world of gender confusion, I want to stress this next phrase. Male and female created be them. Now, that's the book, and we don't apologize for what God did. Male and female created be them, and God blessed them, male and female. And God said unto them, be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. But now watch this. The principle is not restricted to the physical creation. It extends even to the church. In John 15, verse 8, Jesus says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Now I've known them to have Bible classes and debate the whole Bible class whether when Jesus was talking about bearing fruit as his disciple, whether that meant the fruit of the Spirit or a 
uh, bearing fruit, reproducing as a child of God. Well, I would submit to you, I don't know how you do one without doing the other. I don't know how you reproduce as a child of God if you don't bear the first thing in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. I, I think Paul said the fruit of the Spirit is love. I don't know how you reproduce as a Christian in the absence of love. Well, let's turn it around the other way. What if, you, what if I'm bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Well, again, the first thing in the fruit of the Spirit is love. And I don't know how it could be said that you love somebody. If you sit next to them at work for 20, 25 years, live next, to, next door to them 10, 15 years, see them every time you go to the market, but you never open your mouth and tell them anything about King Jesus. They come to your funeral and it's news to them that you even went to church in the first place. I don't know by what definition of love that that could be called love. To do one is to do the other. But the primary consideration for us is, am I a tree that is bearing leaves but no fruit? Do I come to worship on Sunday and maybe to Bible class on Wednesday, but that's all I'm doing? I have leaves, but no fruit. Maybe in this post-COVID, and I'm, I don't know how post-COVID we are, but maybe in this post-COVID world, I'm even coming back to in-person worship. But that's all I'm doing is checking on five boxes. I have leaves, but no fruit. Well, see, the problem with unfruitful trees is that they take up nourishment from the productive trees around them and hinder their growth. Now, it's possible to be an unproductive Christian and hinder the growth of those around me. But watch what Jesus says, John 15, verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. We often wonder why people leave the church. Well, maybe it was not so much that they left as it was they were removed by God. And as Joe Brown used to say, you look better gone. Let me get back over to Luke chapter 13. <laughs> it's clear. 
here from verse number 6. Notice again in Luke 13, verse 6. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and saw fruit thereon, and found none. I submit to you that the problem wasn't that there was a whole lot of fruit. The problem is there was no fruit. You know, every tree don't produce the same amount of fruit. Every Christian doesn't have the same ability and talents. God is not displeased with me because I'm not doing what you're doing. God is displeased with me when I'm not doing what he's enabled me to do. I, I see you come in, my brother. I'm fixing to take my seat. Yes, you know, I just figured preachers always asking the members to cooperate. When it's the preacher's chance to cooperate, he ought to lead by example. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul declares, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That sounds like a second chance to me. We were dead in sin. Jesus paid the price that we could not pay. And now we are made alive in him. Now we have a second chance. The Apostle Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 15 verse number 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now that's true for all of us, the grace of God. I am what I am. But listen to what he says after that. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Also, I didn't waste my second chance. I was dead in sin, just like all the rest of the world. But I was washed by the blood of Jesus as a man of grace. But I didn't waste my second chance. But I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. We are all on our second chance. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but made alive in Christ Jesus. And we haven't gotten it right about everything, uh, uh, every time. But thank God for the grace and mercy that has afforded us a second chance. Amen. But what we need to be mindful of is that we do not know when the second chance is also the last chance. Amen. Let us not presume upon God's grace. In 2 Corinthians 6 verses 1 and 2, Paul says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also, that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Sound like Paul is saying, don't waste your second chance. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I supported thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, that's true other than extending the uh, invitation and gospel means. That's true for you and I every day as we live day by day. May God bless you. May God keep you.
appreciate your brothers being with us and family, and I think we'll be able to conclude in a timely manner today, providing regret. <laughs>
for his mercy endure forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And if anyone has anything to say, we do. Amen. Um, I don't have a lot of time. I have a large text and a short time. If you will meet me in Luke 14, and while you're turning and pressing there, I want to thank uh, the steering committee and the Bell Church of Christ for not only hosting the steering committee for the invitation to brag on an awesome God. I want to thank my loving wife who took some time to hang with her group today. Amen. She is, she shifted and moved her patience so she could be here. And I am truly appreciative of her, as well as also members of 13th Street who are here with us today. Uh, I, I will not be able to finish what I brought. Amen, somebody. But we will try our best. And prayerfully, the clock will not start until I've done reading the text, at least. Amen, somebody. Luke. Chapter 14, uh, beginning at verse 15, the Bible says, When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. But he said unto him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a fig, and I must go and see. Please have me excused. And another, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my man. If time was not of the lessons, three points for which this lesson would hang. Number one, the table is set, but excuses miss the great song. The table is set, and the broken can come feast. The table is set, and the outcasts are invited. And if Brother Johnson and I are in sync, I believe time starts now. Jesus, the great master teacher, while on the road towards Calvary's cross, utilized parables to provide understanding to pertinent information needed for the salvation of one soul. In the parable of the great song, Jesus uses this particular parable to drop the paradigm that someone will not make heaven their home and someone will enjoy the richness of a great song. While the man became excited about the things Jesus was dropping concerning the great supper, he began to get happy about the fact of remembering what was said by Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, of full, of marrow, of aged wine, well-defined. Who would 
where the service is impeccable. Who wouldn't want to sit at the table set by God where the main entree is the glory of God? Who wouldn't want to sit at the table set by God with an item that's on the menu of no more pain, no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more emotional trauma, no more burdens to bear, no more crosses to carry, no more Yeah. Uh -huh. 
The question is today, this afternoon, is there a Christian in the house who has gotten to the position where they said, we will not attend the great banquet? Surely, surely someone here is happy to be more than just that Surely somebody is here happy that I'm more than just a Christian. I am a conquering Christian. Don't be like the three individuals in the text who capture what society or maybe the church might be saying right now. Excuses are in three categories in the text. Excuse number one, I'm attached to worldly things. And so God's invitation is no longer my heart.
Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say together, Amen. 